the University of Waterloo. And he's going to tell us about his title, which is already up there. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining this presentation today. So the name of the session is uh, Urban Climate Challenges. So some of the work that I've done before is on earthquakes, but I promise you that I'm moving towards more and more climate hazards. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here, I also apply for climate hazards. So uh, bear with me on that part. So my name is Rio Costa. I'm an assistant professor in systems design engineering. My background is in structural engineering with a big mix with uh, social sciences. Uh, and I try to, to bring those two areas together in the best way I can. So is there any way for us to... Yes, we can move ahead. Okay. Great. Uh, so unfortunately, I think most of you have seen in the news a lot of information about the recent uh, earthquakes in Turkey. And in many cases, what we see on the news, we see uh, out there, is discussions about the destruction of, the, of our physical environments. However, uh, what is also important to think about is that many of those buildings that we see collapse on the news, uh, people lived in there. And the impact that that earthquake will have on people uh, is going to be greater than any impact we have we can imagine uh, for uh, any physical infrastructure that can be rebuilt. So, whenever we try to think about disasters, in a lot of cases we only talk about mitigation, and we're very optimistic, trying to think in a way that we can mitigate everything. But in many cases, disasters are inevitable. And we have to think about how better we can recover from them. And that's what is called uh, disaster recovery planning in many cases. So in most cases, how people prepare for recovery is that they look at other communities. What happens? What are the challenges that they face? And they try to extrapolate the challenges they see in other communities to the challenges that they would experience if a disaster happened here. The problem is that um, or they just look at disasters in the community that happened like a few years ago. But we know that risk is dynamic, is always changing, and we cannot always extrapolate what we see in other communities and bring that knowledge to our community. Or we are in a community that we haven't been hit by a disaster any time recently, so we don't have lessons to, to drive from those experiences. So I think that in those cases, computational simulations can play a very important role, which is to help us learn from previous communities, but also apply and try to understand what are the possible consequences of disasters within our own uh, communities. So the goal is to have that empirical evidence that social scientists are very good at collecting, and but have those empirical evidence to be also uh, work together with computational simulations to then develop those plannings for disaster mitigation, disaster recovery, all the disaster management cycle. So let's say that that's uh, one goal we have to develop this, the, these models to understand how communities can better prepare for disasters. One of the problems that communities are, how do you even define a community? We have our physical environment, we have people, we have services, we have a multitude of elements within those communities. Um, and there are inconsistent data availability across, like we know more about our physical environment than we know about the people in our communities in most cases. There is decisions that are based about individuals. There are multiple interactions between individuals and between service providers, infrastructure, and those interactions lead to emergence complexity. Uh, in many cases, people don't behave as perfect rational uh, entities. There's a lot of uh, complexity there as well. And many of those people infrastructures, they have shared fates. So if something bad happens to one of them, it may have, uh, may have repercussions across those communities. So the question that comes is that how can we even create a model to do this? And I think that agent-based uh, models um, are one of the ways in which we can do is a, it's been using more and more to combine engineering uh, focused models with societal consequences uh, assessments and try to merge those two together. In one way that I use those models to estimate, to understand post-recovery uh, in communities is to create models in which I have as agents, households, funding agents, 
which are the insurance companies, the banks, the people that finance that recovery, but also service providers, like the engineers you have in the community, the contractors that we need to do those repairs. Of course, there are many more aspects that we could include here, but this is um, the, the gist of how I try to incorporate that. And the goal is to use those recovery models to create what we call recovery curves, which are how we expect the community to behave, let's say, if our metric of recovery is the number of buildings that are functional in a community, we can try to estimate over several years after a disaster, how many buildings will be rebuilt. I'm not saying that the number of homes is the only metric that matters in terms of recovery, but it's one of them. The problem is, and what I wanted to talk to you about here is some of the challenges we have in terms of developing this type of modeling to inform disaster planning, but also some of the opportunities. And the first challenge I wanted to highlight is the fact that agent-based models take a lot of information to do, take a lot of computational time to run. So just to give you an example, a lot of the work that I do is being developed to try to create those agents that represent the funding agencies within a community and how they interact and how households we interact with them. So here is the model, the, uh, the flow chart of the model that involves how people would go about getting funding. This is work done in the US, uh, but how people interact with different agencies at different times uh, during their recovery process. And there's a lot of things that go in there. I, I don't want you to necessarily read this thing. It's just to show you that there's a lot of things that have to be considered. And each one of those boxes, like for example, how, what people, which, what are the demographics of the people that are more or less likely to obtain money from a bank loan, for example. Even trying to estimate that is quite difficult and requires a lot of data. So that's one of the big challenges. ABM is quite data uh, hungry. Another aspect is this, how do we account for socioeconomic inequality? One of the ways that we can do that is by looking at uh, how people interact with losses. A $2,100 losses is gonna be very different by a high income person that has access to insurance, for example, or they can get private loans relatively easily. But a family that is a lower income and they may be reliant on governmental grants, it may take several years for them to obtain that finance. So that's one way in which we can account for that socioeconomic inequality. And uh, we've done that in a few works. So this is like a very brief example of some work that we did. Uh, the, this is a histogram. And on the left-hand side of this histogram, you have like a lot of people that are not reliant on federal grants. Uh, we estimate that they would obtain their funding within a year. But there are people that are more reliant on disaster grants that for them, just the time to obtain the financing to repair their homes could take three, five, six years. But this is one aspect of socioeconomic inequality. How do you bring race in here? How do you bring representativeness? Many people don't have a representative of them in uh, local government to advocate for their needs. So all of those aspects that are not account that are not easy to account for need to be accounted for. And uh, that is a remaining challenge that we have here as well. But there are a lot of opportunities here. So here, what I'm showing here is uh, one uh, study that we've been doing uh, somewhat recently with two communities uh, in California, or actually it's a municipality of Santa Rosa and all the other townships around Santa Rosa within the Sonoma County. They are affected by the Tubbs fire in 2017. And what you're seeing in the solid lines in this plot, are empirical data that the cities collected about the number of buildings that were repaired over time after those wildfires. And what you see in the dashed lines, the dashed lines are results from applying this model that I briefly introduced to you here using agent-based simulation to try to understand that. You can see that it's not a perfect fit. The slope of the curves is a little different, but imagine you as a planner within a few uh, weeks or months of that fires, you were able to have those dash line curves to make your plans. You can start anticipating what will be the needs of this community, how long it will take for us to rebuild, to recover our GDP or whatever other metric you're interested in. Or then you can start going into a little more detail into that model and try to understand why are there people that are taking three, four years to recover. So you can start taking that model apart and then gain a lot of understanding. And, and you can also evaluate, for example, what if we could change something about this 
where they were covering this community. Could we make it better? So I think that's one of the big potential for using application simulations for this type of work. And one thing that is a challenge, but also an opportunity is that I think we need to start teaching our students to conduct this type of model. Maybe you disagree with the AB in ABM, but I think we need to teach modeling to our students for them to be able to do so. Uh, I was very pleased to have the chance to teach a course on computational simulations for the systems design engineering uh, just this uh, last term. I think it was quite successful. And for example, we have, I have here two examples of projects that the students took on themselves. So one of the projects they were looking at the impacts of reducing parking minimums to the revenue of business in downtown Kitchener. Other group was looking at uh, water uh, availability in California and how agricultural needs uh, versus population needs of water from Lake Mead uh, would affect uh, those populations. And those students, they had no idea about modeling before they started the course, very little about uh, programming and they programmed that all from scratch. Very little about probability, which is a little concerning as well. Uh, but they were able to, within a period of about two months to develop models. And of course, you not take these models and take to the mayor of uh, San Joaquin and tell them to make a decision. But now those students know at least where to start. They know that there is this possibility of using computational simulations to inform this type of decision and any other decision related to climate change, which is more related to here. So what I want you to take away from here is that we can use models, specific computational models, uh, to better understand what problems we have to deal with in terms of disaster risk management. Uh, not necessarily to design solutions, but they are a tool to, to help, to help planners, to help people that have uh, experience in that. Uh, and those simulations, depending on the type of approach you have, you can account for physical, social, economic, multiple aspects of, uh, of a community, and you can experiment then with what if scenarios, what if we could improve this, what if we could implement this policy. Uh, there is interest from decision makers and policy makers. I have collaborations with government of California and with Public Safety Canada. They're especially interested in trying to move their analysis from best practices learned over years to a more like optimization type of analysis to how they design their policies. And the last thing is that we need to train our engineers, our planners, uh, all of our uh, students to, to be better suited to use this type of skills. Right? Uh, we've been talking a lot about chat GPT recently and about AI. Uh, I think we need to train our students to be proficient at using that for their professions. And with that, I'll thank you and I'll ask I'll take your questions after we're done with the presentations.